Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I, I think I know a lot of faces in here. Yeah, but uh, some new, like those two guys over there, which <laughs> makes my, my professor there, my other professor, my other professor. Uh, <laughs> hey, so uh, my name is Joseph Mwangi, and uh, I'm going to tell you guys my three fun facts. One, I'm an immigrant from Kenya, and I know how to. I'm an immigrant from Kenya, and I came here five days ago. And during my career here, uh, soon career here at OU, I had a lot of problems regarding food. I don't know if that is a fun fact or not. <laughs> Second fun fact is I love little snuggly dogs, big dog wise. <laughs> I have one at home. Then uh, my last fun fact is uh, with, the, with the US uh, Special Operations here at the Rogers Air National Guard, and they're paying for my tuition here at OU. So those are my three fun facts. Then, um, what I'm going to present to you today is universal cuisine. And you can see the little, is it one? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay, and you can see the little words that I eat like home anyway. So what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? If you can remember from my first fun fact, uh, during my student career I had a lot of problems uh, accessing my authentic Kenyan cuisine. I'm from Kenya. The symbol of yeah? So, um, the first thing that came to my mind is how can I get access to this food that it is super, super hard to get? In the normal area, there is actually no single restaurant that actually serves African cuisines. If I go to Walmart, I cannot find authentic ingredients to cook that. I had to go to my kitchen around 9.30 p.m. and that was very consistent because I'm a commuter. I was living in West Lindsay. So it became so problematic that it became very frustrating for me indeed. And I was like, I miss home food. I love American food, I love the burger, the burgers, the cheese and bacon and all that. But it reaches a time when you, you really need that home cuisine. And I'll give you a scenario. So how many of you have traveled outside the U.S. by show pass? You see, majority in the room. Um, if you don't mind, which country did you go to? Um, all over Europe, Russia, um, North Africa. Oh, you said Africa. Which country in Africa if you don't mind me asking? Algeria. Algeria, good. So, and what's your name, man? Sally. So Sally went to Algeria. So let's assume Sally in Algeria, this is an assumption, it's not true. She lived there for four years as an international student. And she was eating Algerian cuisine day in, day out. Year one goes by. Year two comes by. Day in, day out, Algerian cuisine. By year four, how are you going to be feeling, Sally? I really want some peanut butter. <laughs> you see? So that is exactly what I'm talking about. That is a problem that not, not just me by myself, we have thousands of international students and all you who experience the same problem. And we did a survey at my NVD1 class and NVD2, kind of came over there, and we came to find out that 2,480 something students in the academic year 2017 2018 were experiencing the same problem. So it was not just me, a lot of people. So that is the problem there. And what is the solution? So here, we are working on a mobile app. And I know most of the people will say, we have a lot of mobile app delivery app out there. How is yours different? And I'm going to tell you how it's different. One, we are strictly serving authentic international cuisines. The competition doesn't do that. And that is Uber Eats. Rap Hub is a big guy there. He's acquiring everybody. They just acquired uh, Old Rap the other day. So, but if you look at the way of doing business with Rob they're just serving the big multinational restaurants you see out here, Mark D, you know, all these big restaurants. But that is not solving the problem for people like me, and thousands of them, and thousands across the US. So, um, we have a mobile delivery app that I'm working on right now. It's not even on the App Store, but we have an iOS version that I'm still tweaking right now. I have quarters in Bangladesh, they're working on it right now, and my CTO is in Philadelphia. Because I have I have no background coding as this is what I need here. Then um, another part of the solution is making campus um, community more inclusive. So this is not just for international students. The second tier of the people I'm targeting is uh, everybody, everybody else. Because we have a lot of uh, other people who are wanting to try authentic cuisines. Like I was talking to the two gentlemen over there, and he comes from Texas, between the border of uh, Mexico and Texas, and he was. Raised around almost authentic uh, Mexican foods. And he came to Norman and there was a problem finding that food. So you know, it's not just for international students, even local students experience the same problem but in a different way. 
this amount of us understanding how to tackle that uh, solution, uh, that problem, in the way that they want it to be tackled. Then um, these are the numbers in terms of the market. So right now, uh, we're still trying to track the product market fit. It's been a hassle to do that, but eventually I'm pretty sure we're going to get it. So right now we are looking at the overall students across the US, it's 24 million students right now in the year 2018, 2019 academic year. And if you look at the total international students, and I'm being very conservative with these numbers, I'm, 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 I'm talking about one minute, okay. I'm talking about the, the minimum side. Then at OU alone we have 24, 80 students. These students right here, uh, if they buy, if they buy, the food from nine to eleven dollars, and they say they're going to buy between one to two meals a week. So this is how the model is going to work. Uh, we calculated the total addressable market for all year long, and that is the figure that we got there. Then for the whole of the USA, if you saw the numbers from the whole students who are actually in the US, it comes to eighty-seven million. But we're going to take up to the third year to break even. Then I'm going to go back really quick at the opportunity. We did surveys and. More than half say, of course, they'll buy this food. Then we have 19% who say sometimes. And if you go down there, we ask, how many times a week do you want to buy this? They say more than 50% say once, and more than 30% uh, say more than once. So if you can see, this is very promising. Then, like I was saying, we're working on this. It's not in other episode, but it's coming. And this is a competition. This is a big guy. He's a part of everybody. But his way of doing business is totally different from what, uh, what I'm trying to do here. So that is what is going to differentiate me as a competitor. Like. And he cannot actually uh, do what I'm doing because I have a direct access to international students and companies. He doesn't. His business model does not even care about that. Then we did a 48-hour um, run uh, trial at the Startup Weekend. Uh, that was a few services ago. And that is me with two international students right there. And we used uh, the Indian village on West Lindsay to deliver the foods. We delivered some foods, and this is the feedback. If you can see there, she's saying, this is what we've been waiting for. That is Nafisa right there with a big old smile. <laughs> then these are the other students right there, because we tried this food and they need it. I'm telling you, it's emotional for some people. Because food has a way to make you happy from a psychological level. People connect to food in a way that they don't connect to most of the things out there. And if you're in a foreign land and you don't connect in that manner, you become homesick to an extent that it kind of like pulls down your productivity. So we understand that and that is a problem that we're trying to solve. So I'll finish with this, what you can do because this is a very diverse audience. I'm just going to request that talk about Universal Cuisine. Go look it up and you can follow us on Instagram at Universal underscore Cuisines. And uh, invite people because here in a minute we're going to be looking for drivers. And I know international students don't want a driver's license, so we need local students to do that. <laughs> so uh, please, talk to people about it, and soon go to our uh, app store, download the app, and try the authentic visits. Thank you very much, and I'm going to ask for questions now. So, um, there was a restaurant called Yuyus. Anybody has ever gone to Yuyus in London? Yuyus. The two ladies are wonderful. So they told Yuyus the other day, and I talked to them, and uh, I came actually on the right time. They were like a week away from closing Yuyus. So that lady has been working at Yuyus for a long time. It's a hustle. I was raised with my dad owning a restaurant, so I understand the hustle of a restaurant. You have to wake up early in the morning, you have to be there late at night, all that, and she was getting so upped up, she's like, I need something else. But I love serving the people. So they are closed, and you, you say, when I come back, I want to still serve this food as a commercial kitchen, but not as a restaurant. So they can minimize on the input, but still serve the same uh, uh, kind of people that are coming inside you. Then uh, to extend on that uh, question, we have another family from Ivory Coast. So what I'm trying to do is, I understand that we have some countries which are not represented. You cannot find any restaurants in those countries, but you can find families. Mm -hmm. So it's to go sit down with the family, 
help them understand the vision and help them go through uh, a procedure of having a commercial kitchen in their premises. And if it's, because if you look at the normal laws, they're a little bit different from the OKC on how they do it. But what I'm trying to do is to solve that problem with activating local families to cook for commercial purposes. And they come from Ivory Coast, they can cook banana food, Togolese food, all those countries there at the cost. They can cook all these synthetic foods and they live here in London. So we have you, we have that family, and I'm trying to talk to an Ethiopian uh, family in OKC right now. So that is the way forward of that. Any other questions? Go ahead, sir. You say a great bit of funding. Tell me more about that. So right now, um, like, I would love to bootstrap all the way, but it comes to a point where you need that uh, funding. So right now, the people who are actually coding the app in Bangladesh are coding it right now, but they're not getting paid because they're they are, they are tired of coding apps in the app store. They just pay them a little bit of it, uh, a little bit of money, and they forget about it. So they will eventually own us text minutes. But I know for sure here in a minute we are going to need eighteen thousand dollars because that is the fee that they're charging me, which I do not have. So as much as I love the bootstrap, I'm open for funding. If anybody out here in the crowd thinks, including yourself, thinks that he can come in and uh, provide that kind of funding, then we'll own the source code from this group, the, the technical group in Bangladesh. We'll own the source code, and we'll ask the to own the source code, but as of right now, they own the source code. And to get that source code, we need 18 grand out it. We pay them roughly three grand, uh, like a deposit, to kind of start working on this. And we are doing the iOS, then after that, we're trying to do the Android version of it. Okay, so right now we're focusing around connecting with restaurants, but if you wanted to find the ingredients and cook your own meals at home, are you looking at that at all as well? Yes, ma'am, and that is actually going to even differentiate us even more from the competition. So, universal cuisine is uh, customer centric, and we really understand the behaviors of our target market. So one of the things that these people in the questionnaires that I saw a really tendency in how they answer those questions is they lack a place where they can find authentic ingredients. Like Walmart does not sell it. You have to really go in these little stores which are owned by international people to kind of find those authentic ingredients. So inside the Universal Cuisine app, you can actually find authentic ingredients. And we are going to be sourcing that with all those students at OU, there's so many. And at OU, we have a student organization called the U Culture, the Universal Culture. And it's a lot of students who come together. When they go home, they come with all these authentic ingredients locally from them. Which those ingredients you cannot find anyway. We're going to sell them inside the Universal Cuisine which Graph Hub will never go into that kind. So that is how we become even more different. So how do you define authentic from non-authentic? So like I said, we have a student organization here on campus called the Youth And these are a group of international students from all over the world. OU has roughly between 100 to 125 represented every academic year. These people are my testers, because I don't know how an Algerian cuisine authentic one tests. I just know stuff. So those are the people that I take, and I talk to the prospects, and I'm like, hey, do you mind if I bring like maybe five testers they don't mind because it's a win-win situation. And that is how we differentiate uh, the authentic from non-authentic. And I'll give you an example of the gentleman over there. He came to Norman and he could taste that Mexican food. He's like, no, this is not Mexican. <laughs> See? So those are the people that I'm searching to go represent in Basel Cuisine to differentiate the things. And if more than three people say, you know, this is kind of like, then we don't want to that family or that situation. What's your plan to expand to other, even like universities, and like get the word out about that? Oh, good question. So scaling. So we've done a lot of uh, research on scaling, and we've come up with a strategy of how to scale. One is start from the grassroots. 
That is the best way. Because we are preaching authenticity, that is how we're going to scale. That is our, our, our kind of like a philosophy. So we start at OU and really perform really well at OU. Then we go to our second uh, stop is going to be UCO. UCO does not have a lot of diverse students at OU, but it has some good number It makes a lot of business sense to go there. Then we go there and replicate what we're doing at OU, but we just tweak it a little bit to meet those needs of the students locally there. So we go from one university like that, like that. Then, like I said, we are hoping to break even on the third year. When we break even, uh, then we will now expand outside universities. We now target everybody out there. So that is how we are trying to grow and scale over time. Thank you.